We're here to discuss um, space and the connections with human rights work. Uh, as I said, to my far left is Nicole Wiedersheim. She is the senior policy advisor at the U.S. Holocaust Museum Center for the Prevention of Genocide. Most recently, she was the USAID or USAID Senior Human Rights and Atrocity Prevention Advisor and served through many mass atrocity situations throughout her 12 years in government. She has managed human rights, humanitarian, and political stability programs in Darfur, post-earthquake Haiti, Cote d'Ivoire, Burundi, DRC, or the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Bangladesh, South Sudan, and Rwanda. She also recently served as the National Security Council Director for Central Africa and the Sudans from 2017 to 2018. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you so much for coming down to be with us in this panel. To her right is my colleague, um, and I might have forgotten to introduce myself. My name is Shelley Inglis, and I'm Executive Director for a Human Rights Center at the University of Dayton. My colleague is Professor Umesh Heritasha, and I might not have said that correctly, Umesh, so you can correct me, please. He is an associate professor in the Department of Geology and the Leonard A. Mann Chair in Natural Sciences. He received his PhD in remote sensing and modeling of climate change impact on glacier hydrology, glacial hydrology. In 2005, followed by a postdoctoral training under NASA's projects. Um, Umesh's research primarily involves analyzing glacier complexity and a broader understanding of the climactic impact on glaciers, water resources, natural hazards, and sea level rise. In the last eight years, he and his group have received research grants totaling almost $3 million from agencies such as NASA, USAID, UNDP, and the National Geographic Society. And finally, a man who intersects our human rights experts and our um, <clears throat> spatial geospatial technology experts is Jonathan Drake, who is also from AAAS. And thank you, Jonathan, for joining us on this panel. Jonathan is a planetary scientist by training. He has over 10 years' experience in remote sensing, with a particular emphasis on the ways in which technologies from these fields can be used to benefit the greater good, we call it at U University of Dayton, the common good. At AAAS, he has helped the scientific responsibility, human rights, and law program apply emerging technologies such as satellite imagery, unmanned aerial systems, and GIS in human rights and humanitarian contexts. Through this work with the program, he has provided training to multiple human rights organizations, as well as international courts and commissions on the ways in which these tools can be used to advance human rights documentation and litigation. So there you go. I think it's a fantastically expertise panel. And I want to you know, encourage everyone to ask a lot of questions at the end. We're going to start by just giving you a state of the play in this complex area of geospatial technologies, and in some cases t talking a little bit more narrowly about satellite imagery being used for human rights or humanitarian purposes, and where we are in as a state of play. So maybe we can start with our AAAS hosts uh, to give us a, a, a brief sense of where we are with this technology and its application to human rights issues. Uh, sure, and thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, it it's occurs to me that in order to describe where we are, it it's really necessary, at least in part, to describe where we were, say, around 10 years ago, when, when I first started in this uh, field uh, after moving uh, from... Uh, uh, am I close enough? Can everyone hear? Uh, after, mo after moving from uh, studying uh, Mars to, to studying the Earth and um, realizing that there's a whole lot more going on here, really. Um, so when I first started uh, working with uh, satellite imagery in support of human rights investigations, uh, it was essentially being used, as it, as it still is, but it's a little more complicated than that, as a giant digital camera in the sky, uh, doing pretty simple sort of before and after uh, imagery, structure counts, um, and dealing with uh, <clears throat> uh, the conflict in Darfur was, was really the conflict that really got this started. We were collaborating with Amnesty International uh, as kind of an experiment to see if this even would really work. Um, 
Uh, it turns out it worked very well um, when it worked. But one of the big problems that we had at that time uh, was while there were uh, commercial high resolution remote sensing uh, satellites that were taking these images, uh, the imagery was very expensive uh, because these are businesses, their business model is launching the spacecraft and selling imagery. And you have to sell a lot of imagery at pretty high price point to recoup the cost of a big satellite and a satellite launch. Um, and because those satellites were only in existence since around 1999 and prioritizing areas uh, where they thought there was a market for those images in the global north, uh, the archive of imagery uh, before imagery that we could use to compare uh, and do change detection was very, very shallow and very, very sparse across pretty much all of Africa um, and, and, and many other areas that, that were not uh, you know, high priority areas for these companies. Uh, so what we often had to do was uh, request an image of an area where we had reports from our NGO partners uh, that uh, uh, an, an atrocity of some kind had taken place uh, and see if we could just infer whether that was taken place um, based on what we saw in that single image because there was no high resolution basis to compare it with. Um, that has changed dramatically since then. Uh, global coverage, many more satellites have been launched in the interim, um, the existing satellites have continued to produce data, and now there's a very, very deep archive uh, of imagery covering almost the entire planet. Uh, and it's, uh, the rate of data production has gone up enormously. Uh, what that means is that it's sort of the best of times and the worst of times for us as analysts. Uh, you have plenty of uh, reference imagery that you can use uh, to compare what's happening today with what, ha with what happened a couple years ago, uh, or even within various months of a year uh, these days. Uh, at the same time, you have a ton of imagery, and it really begins to outstrip the means of human analysts to uh, uh, to deal with, especially when you're dealing with phenomena that are spread over larger areas than areas that are very, very heavily localized. Um, and so you've got that sort of day or, uh, one of the previous presenters mentioned drinking from a high fire hose. That's exactly what we're having to do right now. Um, and there just aren't enough uh, trained observers to really interpret all of this imagery. So thankfully, there are new developments on the horizon that promise potentially to help uh, deal with that in terms of tipping and queuing important areas to human analysts. Machine learning is one of them. Uh, crowdsourcing is another. Both of them have pretty significant issues associated with them. When they work, they work great. When they don't work, oh boy, do they not work. Um, so, so that's sort of where we are. We're still kind of trying to figure out how to deal with this rapid change in the information environment. Um, the potential is very, very great, um, but uh, the, uh, the challenges for implementation are, uh, are significant, and, it, and it's the opposite challenge of the one that we were facing just a few years ago. Great. Nicole, uh, over to you to talk a little bit about your sense of the state of play and where you've seen um, geospatial technologies and satellite imagery, if you want, even more narrowly applied. Sure. Um, hello. I think I'm on. Yes. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's, it's a little intimidating to be in a room full of scientists because I couldn't be further away from uh, that technical field, so forgive me for not getting the verbiage or uh, other things correct. Uh, it's ironic that um, we're both on the panel because my first experience of seeing satellite imagery come to, come to play uh, a role um, in mass atrocities and disaster was when I was based on the ground in Darfur. I was there with uh, USAID's Foreign Disasters DART team. Um, and I was specifically charged at the time with trying to get real-time information back to Washington um, on the nature of the human rights abuses uh, and the attacks. So we had humanitarian response, and those, those were my other colleagues in USAID, and then I was there as a, what we called at the time a protection officer. We've later adopted that language as a human rights officer. Um, and this was in 2005, February is when I got on the ground, so a lot of the uh, atrocities had already been happening for the bulk of 2004 and continuing into the fall of 2005. Um, so we were having weekly sat phone calls and I was building relationships with NGOs and also going out with the peacekeepers as a US government person and looking at the attacks. Um, 
the the imagery uh, that the U.S. government was using internally had already driven. Uh, it was actually DOD and their and their imagery that first alerted the entire U.S. government internally only. Something's going on in Darfur. It wasn't an area of strategic uh, purpose or interest for the U.S. government. Um, we there was no interagency process on that part of the country. We were really focused at the time of trying to get a comprehensive peace agreement in South Sudan. Um, but DOD was noticing these things internally. Um, and as, as Jonathan knows, even if there's pretty high, you know, high resolution or very uh, telling satellite imagery in the U.S. government, they're not going to release it pub publicly, right? So this is the value of having organizations like uh, Jonathan's and others that work on this in a private sector. Um, but that's what alerted the interagency, and then that's how we got the dart on the ground, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the availability of the external imagery of the burned villages drove the pressure uh, of which, at the time, Secretary of State Colin Powell responded to, to say, all right, let's go out and do a documentation effort and see if genocide is what's happening. Um, we had the imagery inside the U.S. government, but the political and public and advocacy pressure to push big things like that, documentation and investigation of a genocide, to mobilize millions of resources, to put American officials on the ground in three sites. We were based in three of the Darfur uh, capitals and moving um, to keep us there after one of my colleagues was shot in the head, she survived. Uh, but to keep us there, the political pressure to keep, I mean, this was obviously pre-Benghazi. Um, all of that was coming from these images that were now available in the public that were very crystal clear. There was a village there and then there wasn't a village there. Uh, so that was my first introduction to it, finding it as a way in which it galvanized action and policy shifts, or the discussion of, if you will, policy shifts uh, in the U.S. government. I would say that when we did a de genocide de a determination uh, in, in uh, 2005, 2004, 2005, uh, it was a high watermark for the U.S. government leaning very forward. No other country made that determination on Darfur, and uh, neither did the U.N., um, so that's a really kind of clear point that I've seen. Um, another experience I had in 2010 was responding to the Haiti earthquake. So we can talk more about that, but that's a different, that's more of like the operational response. Yeah, no, so I mean, that's atrocities and also earthquakes. I think that's, Umesh, moving to you, that's the area with your scientific background that you first got exposed to applying your scientific academic work to humanitarian issues, right? Sure, yeah. So, um, like Nicole said about the uh, scientists being in the room, I'm intimidated because so many human rights folks are in the room. <laughs> Coming from an academic side, a lot of time we, we work in the human rights, but we don't consider ourselves because we don't have the understanding of the uh, nuances that require to understand the uh, issues that we are dealing with. So, uh, um, as, as, as Shelley said earlier, I'm doing the satellite remote sensing analysis for pretty much last 20 years or so, uh, but mostly to understand the geological changes, the glacier changes, how the climate change impacts the glaciers. So we go to these high mountains and collect the data set, come back to the lab, use the satellite images to analyze those glaciers, the movement of the ice, ice and uh, uh, melting processes, how the downstream areas, communities are uh, living off of those water or using the water, how the uh, drainage system works, things like that. So there's lots of uh, uh, different uh, geological understanding of, um, of glacier changes, but also how satellite uh, can be used to extract the scientific information out of those, uh, uh, like Jonathan said, a big bulky camera up in the sky but extract the information and not just look at these pictures from a perspective that, well, this is what happened at one time and this is what's happening at the second time, but, but go deeper into it and extract some information to do some real analysis. Uh, so that's, that's what we've been doing, and I think a lot of my colleagues have been doing that for uh, uh, many, many years. But at, at the background, I think most scientists, and I think some, many of you sitting here will relate with me, that at the background, we always think about how our science can be utilized. And as Kristen said in the morning, 
that uh, what's the mission? What are we doing with all these things? Our day-to-day -day goal is uh, go to the lab, work on something, publish paper, which is basically read by our peers and nobody else reads it. <laughs> Uh, write proposal, uh, get the grant money, do more research, publish more paper. But what's the mission? And that's, uh, uh, I think, a lot of uh, scientists uh, realize it, but on a day-to-day -day basis, they don't really uh, work towards it because of many other issues, uh, within, at least within the academic community. So uh, uh, my tube light, as you will think, how it started, <laughs> basically two incidents I can recall. One is, I'll get to the earthquake here in a minute because that was the major one. But because before the earthquake, I am working in most of the Himalayan countries, in New Zealand, in Alaska, um, in Colorado, Rocky Mountains. So those are my research areas that I work in. So in, and one of the things that I work mainly in is called glacial lakes. So as the climate is changing, lakes are growing, uh, glaciers are melting extremely fast. Lakes are growing, they basically hold many, many millions of gallons of water and they are up in the high mountains. So if they burst out, they're gonna release uh, tons of water and the downstream communities are going to have a major impact of it. So that's the, that's the gist of it. But um, so UNDP uh, rolled out a call back in 2013, I believe, uh, that well, um, there's a major lake here in, in the Everest region, which is one of my uh, research area, uh, so uh, we are we are interested in thinking about uh, whether it is at the point where uh, the water may release or what can be done. And our group responded to it. And I'm going to say a lot about our because in scientific community, as many of you uh, will relate, we work in a collaborative projects with multiple people, multiple agencies together. So our group responded, and we uh, were awarded that project. And we went there, and we worked on uh, understanding the uh, capacity of the lake and where it is and uh, based on our work the lake was lowered so that was the uh, work that we did directly to impact the humanitarian issues that may not have occurred at this point but could occur in the future so looking into the future aspect and not just the current thing. So that was 2014. And in 2015, we were planning to go back and do some field work there. And uh, as in the glaciers area, mostly you go in the summer because otherwise it's frozen. Uh, so on April 25th in 2015, a major earthquake struck Nepal. And uh, thousands and thousands of life destroyed, our field plan destroyed. Uh, we, at that point, um, and I, I'll shout out to a colleague in Arizona, uh, he immediately uh, put together and called me and a couple of other folks that what can we do? I mean, we as a scientist sitting in our lab doing the things, going to the Nepal, working in those uh, communities, and communities affected by it. So what can we do? And uh, uh, the, the expertise that we have is basically looking at the satellite images and, and, and analyzing it in such a way that can be helpful. So we said, well, let's put together a, a, a call for volunteers and whoever will respond and we'll get together. So within about, I would say, 24 hours or so, we had uh, uh, 50 plus scientists within 24 hours from these renowned folks sitting in their lab from various parts of the world uh, uh, responding to our call that, yes, we can lend the hand and, and do the work. So uh, next two months, and as he always says, um, two months of uh, uh, time from April 25th to, let's say, July or so, we aged probably five, ten years because we were constantly working in about first week or so. Uh, uh, so. As Nepal, some of you would know that uh, it's a mountainous country. So when the earthquake strikes, it's basically landslides, buries the village, uh, uh, roads are cut, network, there's nothing, no way you can communicate. So we were looking at these high resolution satellite images and directing through our network to the cabinets in the Nepal uh, to allocate the resources. And uh, that was the um, eye-opening experience that I had where I thought that, well, I've been doing this thing for so long, and this is not the first hazard in my lifetime that has occurred, but this is the first time that the experience has been rewarding. 
Uh, and, and at that time, it was purely humanitarian. We didn't thought about publication. We didn't thought about the money. We didn't thought about anything. I actually had a son about 20 days before that event, and we were working 16 hours a day holding the guy in the hand, and so did actually one of other colleagues too. So uh, the, the experience was rewarding. Later, we actually approached uh, AAAS uh, editor, and uh, we published our paper in Science Magazine um, because of how the volunteer response came uh, to help uh, use the satellite images and help analyze the data set in the ground and actually make a difference in the ground. So I, I can talk a lot, lot more about that later. Yeah, we're going to go around so everybody gets it. I don't know if, Jonathan, you want to say, so we had Darfur for the initial monitoring some forms of investigation, the use in humanitarian and response to humanitarian disasters and natural disasters. Do you want to say anything about some of the cases you've been working on from AAAS in terms of other forms of use? like criminal um, prosecutions? And uh, well, I, I can certainly say that uh, there is increased interest uh, and, uh, in the use of this type of evidence in uh, international human rights litigation. And AAAS uh, put out a, a comprehensive review of, uh, of geospatial evidence in international human rights litigation. Um, that's the title of the report. Um, please search for it, 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 it and read it. It's, it's very interesting. Um, we have not yet really seen a, a, a real test case in terms of uh, geospatial evidence being really the, um, the clincher of a case. We keep on hoping that uh, one might happen. One almost happened recently in The Hague when there was an individual who was uh, uh, accused of destroying uh, some ancient mausoleums in, in Mali, uh, and there was lots of geospatial evidence of uh, the destruction, as well as social media evidence of that destruction, uh, and everyone thought, oh, th this is going to be it, this is going to be the case that really shows that this is, you know, come into its own as evidence, right? Uh, and he pled guilty. So uh, we never it got to... It was because he saw that evidence. It right? may have been. <laughs> you know, I, we can't get into his head about that, right? But. Um, uh, so there is certainly lots of interest in that. They they continue, international courts continue to uh, be interested in this type of evidence. Um, I've worked with some of them on that sort of thing. Unfortunately, as cool as it is, and I can't talk about the details of that. Um, one thing that I can mention, though, I, I mentioned that, that case uh, where there's satellite imagery and social media, uh, you know, ground-based uh, uh, cell phone video. And that's another thing uh, when we're talking about the current state of play that has changed dramatically uh, since we began, right? Uh, you know, when we started out, um, these places uh, on the ground, Darfur, for example, were essentially denied access areas. You couldn't get any information in or out, uh, uh, at least through non governmental DOD type channels, uh, right? Um, look at the war in Syria, right? You know, every airstrike is filmed from 10 different angles now. Um, that's very, very helpful uh, to us uh, in terms of triangulating this information because uh, even when we were working uh, uh, earlier on, uh, there's only so much that imagery alone can tell you. Uh, you really need that context. Uh, either just even eyewitness reports uh, on the ground uh, some grainy photos or videos, but something uh, to uh, ground truth what you're seeing. Um, because otherwise, there are usually a couple of reasonable uh, solutions to the sort of question of what's going on down there. And some of them are often much more innocuous than others. Mm -hmm. um, and even experienced analysts make mistakes in that regard. You know, there are many times that I've looked at an image and said, aha, look at this airstrike. And then only later when more information emerged, be like, well, that, that certainly wasn't that what that was, right? Um, and so that goes into the, you know, some of the potential problems when you deal with you know, algorithms or crowdsourcing, right? You know, if someone who has that uh, um, interpretive experience and skill, to the extent that I can say that I have any of that, um, can make those mistakes, right? You know, multiply that by whatever. And so. Anyway, but, but context is key, and, and the, uh, the social media information environment has really changed the game in that regard. Yeah, and of course, Facebook and social media was a huge part of the investigation in Myanmar, but that does take us to our next um, question, which is really about the challenges. So, you know, we've seen this huge uh, progress in the use of remote sensing and geospatial technologies, um, and they are now integrated in many human rights organizations and used commonly. But there are key challenges to 
their use, some of which you were saying, Jonathan, are intimating to. I mean, any of us who've worked on cases know that you need context for any kind of evidence, but clearly that's one of the drawbacks. Umesh, can you think of other limitations from a technical point of view on the use of these kinds of um, technologies? Well, um, there are a bunch. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so let me uh, give you a background story here in order to uh, explain. Basically, satellites are up in the sky for a very long time. If you, um, some of you may be aware of it, back in, uh, the first satellite was back in 1959, the Corona Keyhole data set uh, was basically a spy satellite which was a declassified data set until recently. And uh, so, Back in 70s is when the satellite became mainstream in, in for civilians to actually use it uh, for mostly the scientific purpose. But the the challenges that we faced uh, we, that we face today based on the 1950s 1960s data set they were essentially a, a, a cameras up in the sky as we said earlier basically just taking the picture with without any. Uh, uh, information that we can use to process the data set or to, or to rectify the data set. As, On photographic film, by the uh, way. Basically. <laughs> it's actually pretty fascinating. I, I've worked with that. They are pain, but they, they, they give you the information about uh, a half a century back, and that's fascinating to see how the changes have occurred. So uh, uh, fast forward, the drawbacks that we have are many, but some of those drawbacks that we can think about it, and at this context is the spatial resolution, and I'll tell you what that is, temporal resolution, and the spectral resolution. These are the three major things that I think about. Spatial resolution meaning that, well, can I go and look at my house and what my neighbor is doing in his backyard uh, on Google Earth. Yes, I can do that, but I can't really use that Google Earth image to directly download it. There are some mechanisms now you can do it through Google Earth Engine and whatnot, but we need a high resolution data set which are not free. So for, for, a, for an individual to just go and download the data set and, and look what's going on, it's not possible. So you can use the Landsat uh, data set which became free since 2008 um, uh, and there's a caveat that I'm going to talk here in a second, uh, but that's a 30 meter resolution. So you're going to see uh, on the ground a 30 meter by 30 meter uh, pixel. So that's the size of the data set that we are talking about. Uh, we also are thinking about temporal resolution. So if you are thinking about any of the uh, incident on the ground from a human rights perspective, uh, what is the time span do you want that data set to reflect? Meaning that a satellite uh, looks at your location where we are sitting right now on let's say January 1st, but satellite is not going to come back and look at that exact same spot until two weeks later or three weeks later or, or a week later depending on the satellite or even one day later but then the resolution becomes too big to do some, some, some localized analysis. So those are the challenges that we face on a daily basis. When I said caveat about the Landsat, so in 2018 it came out that the current administration is looking into uh, charging it. So before 2008, we had to pay money to get the satellite, which were built based on the taxpayer's dollar, to get the data set and then do the analysis. So it's free. Before that uh, satellite became free, the download was probably a couple hundred a month, couple, maybe a thousand. I don't, I don't think it's a thousand, probably way less than a thousand a year. Now it's 20 million download per year, and the amount of work that has generated uh, is, is tremendous. So the, the drawbacks or the challenges obviously revolves around the cost, revolves around the accessibility, revolves around the resolution of the data set. Um, we also can think about what kind of these data sets. So uh, yesterday I, I um, uh, came to DC and it was raining. So let's say if an atrocity is occurring there and that day happened to be cloudy day when the satellite is passing, you're not gonna get anything. Basically it's cloud. So then you have to wait for two more weeks or three more weeks before the data can be captured. So there are a host of issues that we are dealing with, but um, at the same time, as Jonathan uh, said earlier, 
the, the scene has changed tremendously. We have so much more data now than we ever had, or we have capacity to actually process those data sets. So it's getting there. Uh, can I say that it's already there? No, there are lots of challenges that we have uh, um, that we need to work on. And one final uh, thought I'll mention and then I'll move on, which is the these data sets are complex. They are not a cell phone picture uh, where I can look at uh, two timestamps. So if I have a data set from Landsat and I have a data set from, let's say, a European Satellite Agency, SPART, or Sentinel, or any of the other data set, they are um, not apples to apples. We can't compare them uh, uh, just like any uh, two phones. Um, so there are complexity associated with it, and as Jonathan said again, which is that uh, we make mistakes all the time. So we don't have a ready-made algorithms which can uh, plug in for all purpose. Uh, all size fits doesn't work here. So those are the challenges that we are dealing with right now. Thanks. But um, yeah. So Nicole, from the the human rights or um, mass atrocity prevention perspective, what do you see as the challenges with the current state of play? Well, the one of the obvious challenges that Jonathan mentioned was um, we don't know who are doing these atrocities. Uh, so um, and human rights activists uh, and policy people and documentarians, all of those folks are really focused on the human. <laughs> so they're focused on the victim and the survivor. Uh, and if there is a way to always match uh, the, the big picture and the, um, the, the type of work we're talking about right now with an on-the-ground context, it's very, very important um, to having a successful litigation. It's very, very important um, going back to one of the big, biggest challenges I see here um, is prevention. Uh, for the next time. So this, so I had made a list of like the cost, which we're talking about, the timing, um, is it too late? I mean, most people who work on human rights and mass atrocities want to prevent it. They don't, there's, there's a, obviously you want to respond to it, you want to bring justice, but m the main point is to prevent people from getting hurt and killed. Um, and so by the time these images are available and of use, it's, it's really too late for a large number of people. Now it should then feed into the cycle that you're preventing the next round of killing or violence um, and shifting the policy that allowed uh, that, con that incident to happen or, or, or like an enabling environment. Um, but uh, you know, I always worry when, when there's so little bit of funding for human rights anywhere and, and a little bit of focus within any government administration on human rights uh, that uh, to get people focused, one, on prevention and then focused on response to human rights, uh, it's, it's really hard. Um, so what happens is, and I've seen this in other places, uh, so the, the cost, the timing, the coordination, I think you're, you're hitting on that a little bit. Um, do we have the right people together in the room? You know, can like someone who is trying to organize a policy or a peacekeeping operation um, or a humanitarian response or going out and documenting and interviewing the survivors, can they understand the information you're presenting them with? Uh, you know, do they understand the terminology? Do they even know who's doing it? Um, you know, where are you guys talking and meeting and discussing this? Um, I spoke to a really interesting woman in trying to get a, just slightly smarter on this topic <laughs> because I was like, I don't know the technology side of this. And she worked at NASA, and NASA has this whole unit on disaster response, and they work with the US, US aid. And, and so she was telling me that she's also not a techie person or a, like a science person per se. She literally spent most of her job trying to connect the right people connect the humanitarians, connect the planners, connect the budget people. If, if we're seeing all of this information on the effects of climate change, which is greatly exacerbating atrocity risks, or land occupation and displacement, which is also another use, uh, you know, is that, are, are, is that going, are the, are the same people who are count, making these budgets five fiscal years out and making these p country strategies for USAID or you know, our NGOs who think long term, and there's, there's many out there who think who are development actors, 
Um, I used to work for Oxfam, and they're, you know, they do response, but their main jam is development, and they're thinking about agricultural needs way far out. Are all these people right in the same room thinking about this, and are they able to listen to each other's language uh, and understand it? So, um, and then, you know, thinking back to, to, to my new home at the Holocaust Museum, um, uh, we have a new exhibit right now uh, in the main part of the building, and it's, uh, it takes 45, I'm going to put a plug in it because of, it's, a, you know, going through the Holocaust Museum is really, uh, a lot of people don't want to spend their Saturday day doing that. It's very um, traumatic. But uh, we have an exhibit right now called Americans and the Holocaust. It's only 45 minutes, and it's going to be up for another two years. And it actually tells us how much we knew before, and there was no geospatial imagery, but how much did we know, uh, and we still were fighting inside bureaucratically to not respond. Uh, there was external forces in this country that didn't want to get pulled into the war. So I was thinking today, when I was thinking about, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the cases that I've seen, you know, the planning, the Darfur and Haiti response, and even most presently, uh, even in Cameroon, the satellite imagery that was made available to our embassy there made a shift in our, our positions, right, our policy right now in Cameroon. You know, if there was this imagery it, during the Holocaust, uh, the exhibit that we have right now in the museum is telling me, I don't know that it would have mattered. It wouldn't have moved it faster. Um, because there were so many other things pressing on it. So, you know, I think I, I, we're raising challenges. And, and, and so I just, I throw that out there um, because we know so much after nine years of atrocities in Syria, there's no denying it. And we're right down to the point now where there's still atrocities happening. Jonathan, I get the sense you want to respond. Uh, well, yeah, no, so I, I agree. And, and the, the challenge of how you measure your impact is, is certainly one of them, right? You know. Uh, can you say that uh, you know because uh, we took imagery of this atrocity and that atrocity, you know, untold other atrocities did not take place? You know that that's proving a negative, and so that's that's one of the uh, real challenges is measuring your impact. And along with that comes uh, you know what does it take to move public opinion and to to actually affect a, a mobilization? Um, that's not my area of expertise, but it's it's a very nonlinear system. The the only thing that we as analysts I think can say is you know well it, it all helps right and it, it uh, uh, sunlight in, is a disinfectant in in, in that sort of uh, that sort of way. Um, but along with that, a, a big challenge when you deal with uh, the public and and even not the public but you know um, non specialists in geospatial information is that they have perceptions of what uh, these data products can show that generally come from mass media, uh, you know, from, from movies, from, uh, you know, you've got enemy of the state where you're tracking Will Smith and he looks up in the sky because he's getting in the car and the satellite sees him and, you know, you're, you're running around and, um, you know, or uh, how many times I think in, in various TV shows and movies have, you know, you seen a big blurry pixelated image and the, you know, the technician goes, you know, the, 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 the boss, the boss goes to the, the technician and says, enhance that. Yes. <laughs> and you see everything. Yeah, it does not work that way, right? Um, if that worked, the thing, yeah, that, that'd be great, right? I, I, I wouldn't work from here um, if I could do that. But um, maybe I would. <laughs> anyway, um, so, so one of the things that we do when we do trainings with courts and commissions, for example, is have a whole presentation on dispelling what this stuff can do and what it can't do. Um, because, you know, the idea that this is this objective, all-seeing eye is, it, it's, it's kind of true in some ways, right? But, uh, you know, when you combine um, the imagery with um, the perception, sometimes you can get responses from your audience that are not entirely right. Um, you know. And, 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 and there are adversaries in the information space that try to play on that. And that's another challenge that we're starting to see now, is that now that GIS and remote sensing have kind of gone mainstream uh, in human rights situations where there are also interested political actors, uh, there are uh, now beginning, uh, some of them are beginning to attempt to muddy the waters uh, of, of that information space by releasing their own satellite imagery um, that purports to show that you know your analysis is just totally bunk. Um, the, the 
most clear cut of example of that as yet has been uh, with the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, uh, where there have been uh, uh, open source analysis groups, AAAS among them, um, as well as Western country, Western governments, NATO uh, publishing imagery, uh, you know, saying that look, there's large military buildup in southwestern Russia near the Ukrainian border. Um, you know, uh, here are some surface-to-air missile launchers. Oh, and by the way, there was a Malaysian airliner that got shot down, and several hundred, you know, Dutch people were killed. Right, um, and uh, you know, Vlad, what do you have to say about this? Right, uh, and uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense shortly thereafter uh, published. Uh, black and white imagery, uh, no metadata associated with it except a date and time stamp and some other stuff physically on the image that you could grab off of their PowerPoint. Um, and they said, no, 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 this is, the, you know, look at this image, which we took from our satellites, presumably their Ministry of Defense satellites, right, and it shows a Ukrainian surface-to-air missile launcher in the same place, and therefore it was actually, actually it was Ukraine that did this, not Russia. Sound familiar? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, this is not um, this is not the thing. Now, we analyzed that image. Um, we took a look at the shadows. There were thankfully two very, very distinct poles, uh, vertical poles in that image. You could use to measure the angle of the sun. Um, long story short, they were lying about when that image was taken, and therefore the timeline was off. Right, but. And to the point getting to the challenge is that didn't actually really matter because by the time it took to do that, the news cycle had moved on and it was just sort of a post hoc, right? You know, well, you know, okay, right, but you know, that was never their intention was to fool sophisticated forensic investigators. Their intention was to, you know, sow uncertainty and they absolutely did that. So that's another challenge that's, I think, emerging. Um, and, and, and you know, you may start to see non-state actors attempt to do that too. Uh, there are some challenges for that because they don't own their own satellites. But yeah. I wouldn't, I would not be surprised. I, I don't think that's the last time we've seen uh, that sort of back and forth. Right. Okay. So I want to give everybody an opportunity to ask questions because I think this is a fascinating discussion. We've tried to take you through. Uh, where we are in the state of play, then some of the challenges, both from the technology side, but ob obviously also from the broader political policy uh, and ultimate aims side of uh, preventing human rights violations, uh, humanitarian disasters, and um, mass atrocities. But before I hand it over to you, and I'm just doing this so that you all sort of get your questions together and run up, uh, up to those mics, um, I'm going to give the panel one last chance to look into the future, to, to just give a, a sense of where they think we're going. Of course, everybody nowadays says the future is now, but also we have no idea what's going to happen in the future because things change so quickly. So none of this is to say that anybody here has the, the, the magic ball. But I do want to get a sense of where you think we're going in, in this field, um, and I want you all to get your questions together and, and start moving towards uh, the microphones. So let's start with Umesh. Um, why don't you give a sense of where you think we're going briefly, and um, then we'll go to the rest of the panel. Well, um, let me start with uh, what Nicole was saying earlier, that um, one of the challenges that we have is um, these, uh, these images tell us what occurred once the issues has already occurred, whether it's mass atrocities or anything else uh, that matters uh, um, for, for this audience. So um, can we uh, do something uh, from a prevention standpoint? Uh, there will always be challenges to that question. However, I'm an optimistic person in, in many ways, and I think we have made a lot of uh, a good stride. And uh, some folks earlier in one of the panel were talking about the artificial intelligence, machine learning. And I think uh, uh, we are at the point, and this is some, some of those, this research is happening in my lab, uh, PhD students are working on it, which is uh, to how can we learn the signals from these uh, satellite images and uh, can we apply it to something in the future? Now, uh, mind it, we work on a, on, on a geological changes and they happen in a geological scale. So it's relatively easier to do things. And here we are talking about one night, nothing happening in the village. Next day, it's gone. So that's a rapid change we are talking. But 
can, in order for that, and I'm using that as an example, and I am uh, a relatively new in human rights world. I've learned a lot from Shelley, and this, this, this conference has been a great in, in, in my experience. Uh, uh, so uh, please excuse if I'm not using the right language or not explaining it uh, right or, or not using it in a, in a proper sense. But uh, in order for that example to occur overnight, something must have moved day before, two days before, a week before, somewhere around that area for that yes. thing to occur overnight. So can we use those signals, can we use those um, patterns to recognize these things in, in advance? Now, I'll go back to one of the points I was making earlier, which is that we need the data sets to do that. We need a daily scale data sets. Uh, we need a weekly data set, that too high resolution data sets. And, and, and so mm, where the future lies, and I think this is one of those areas where future lies, uh, which is to um, how can we utilize these satellite data sets to prevent or to at least uh, forecast some of these things before it happens. The, the other areas I think is, uh, um, there's lots of gap in the data set. So can we use the uh, cell phone video? Can we use the field photographs, which doesn't necessarily come with a uh, metadata that we generally need? But nowadays, if you're taking from one of these cell phones, they have the GPS and they generally record the positional location. So it, it becomes easier for uh, uh, analysts to sit there and look at these two data set and try and marry them together to see if there is a, a better information that we can extract or fill the gaps before the next satellite comes in or next in images are produced. Now, this was not possible um, 20 years back. This is possible now. Even a uh, uh, digital elevation model, I mean, if you go to the, uh, to the um, and that's a jargon uh, scientists generally use, but this is um, uh, three-dimensional data sets. So if you go to Google Earth, you, what you're looking at, you're looking at three-dimensional data sets. So uh, they have the errors in it. All these data sets have errors. So uh, uh, looking into the future, I think the data set with less error, uh, uh, more data sets with uh, uh, less, um, gap, uh, hyperspectral data sets, which are another kind of a data set, or data set with less cloud cover, radar data set. So those are the things that I think, um, along with the machine learning aspect, is going to help us move into the right direction. I'll actually mention two more things, and, and, and then I'll uh, move it to other panel members. One is, um, there's, there's, there's a, and I'm not uh, uh, advocating, but uh, there's a Google Earth engine, which is a, a, a publicly available platform where millions of images are available. You can basically run these uh, R Python-based uh, uh, models on these platform with thousands and millions of images uh, in your purview. So I think uh, uh, facilities are there for folks to utilize. Um, uh, organizations like AAAS and other, I met a couple people, other, a uh, few other people during lunchtime. Uh, they are there for uh, you to utilize. Uh, scientists are willing to help um, uh, once they have been given the context. So I think it's moving towards the right direction. So future is great. And, and uh, picking the last point, which is what Nicole was saying about the uh, NASA program, disaster program, which is a great one. I've, I've been associated with that program for quite some time. David Green is the program manager. He is his hands full because natural hazards occur all the time. And, and the another program which I'll shout out, which is what actually involved me, which is a pro and this kind of a program actually we need, um, is, is uh, another thing that, that's in the future require, which is program called Server. This is a joint venture between NASA and USAID, which is what funded my work at that time and through which I involved. This has uh, uh, hubs in, in Himalayan countries, hubs in Africa, hubs in Latin America, uh, and they are working, uh, doing great job. And there's lots of uh, easy to understand mm -hmm. uh, publicly uh, uh, communication, public communications out there on their website which you can utilize, uh, not the 
a 20 page uh, uh, scientific paper, but how those 20 page scientific paper can relate to the uh, a local person uh, who is on the ground and the capacity building. So the last point I think is the capacity building. <laughs> Great, thanks very much. So we've got potential for putting the resources behind specific programs. We have the potential for actually using this imagery in an appropriate way for prevention. Nicole, do you have see other things into the future that um, we should be thinking yeah, about? Yeah, two, two things, and then I'll, I'll be brief so we can get to the questions. Um, and I'm taking notes as I was talking, so. <laughs> uh, because, well, first off, three things. One, um, we know that we need to be thinking about the future uh, in, in my um, home organization right now. We are actually planning um, with the, the academic community that works on um, atrocities and research and trying to track uh, indicators, um, a, a seminar next year um, and a call for papers on what is the future of mass atrocities. So it's everything, it's the machine learning, it's the social media, it's the acknowledgement that actually global trends are going in a right direction that mass atrocities are, are actually dropping over the last 20 to 50 years. It's, it's odd when you think of the headlines, but, um, but what will new weapons look like? What will atrocities look like? So this is very relevant and I, I hope you continue to talk about this in your, in, and entity, uh, gatherings like this. The one, one thing I would wanna say to, to um, where, where I hope we're going, uh, which I'm so happy you mentioned that on the prevention angle. One thing is clear when you study mass atrocities, and there's a data set that starts after World War II, um, is that they're not spontaneous, genocides and mass atrocities are not spontaneous events. They take planning, they take ideology, they give tons of warning signs, whether we're paying attention or not. Uh, sometimes they're really resource heavy, Wep moving weapons, moving trucks, moving parts of the community, you know, young men that would work, previously be seen working in the fields, all of a sudden they're gone. Where are they? Um, so I think there is, I, I think it's hard for me to think how generally that could be, but for if you drill down to the context specific, I think there could be a marriage of um, looking at those preparatory plans and what's showing up in imagery. Where are, where are all the military trucks that used to be by the airport? They're gone. They're, they're, they've been taken out of the capital city. Where'd they go? You know, things like this. Um, and I think about right now a real life case um, with the, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang is that what we're seeing, terrible, I have no Chinese skills, excuse me, my that pronunciation. Um, we, you can't see what's going on. I was, de I was exactly one of those policy people saying to the NGA, well, can't we figure out what's going on? Just drill down with those super high-tech cameras you guys got and see where these people are. You know, I would, that's a real life way that people who don't understand this technology uh, ask for images. But what we are seeing now is the establishment of new factories in other parts of China. So we feel, is that an expansion of their uh, reported massive human rights violations? Kind of looks like it but we don't know for sure, but it's sending us, it's starting the conversation, it's sending us down a trail. So I hope, just the future of it, I hope that we continue to think about bringing different people in the room to explore how we can work more closely together. Right. And, and developing the skills across these sectors, which is something AAAS is, has been doing, as well as obviously looking at all the technology in broader context with other indicators and other ways of assessing um, prevention. Jonathan, I'm going to give you the last word. I noticed nobody's running to the microphone, so um, it's not time I, yet. I, it's not time yet. I didn't. Th I thought. I thought we were talking. Then we were. Uh, yeah. Never, never. You've been. Ta yes. We're. Oh, look. Oh, there there go. Go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Jonathan, you. you've got the last word before we go over to the questions. Okay. Uh, the data fire hose problem is only going to get much, much, much worse. Um, they are going to continue to launch more and more satellites. More and more people are going to be collecting more and more data, and it's all going to be landing on our heads. Um, so if you're interested in this sort of thing as a potential career, I know there are a couple students around here, help us, please. Um, machine learning uh, is going to be a... Uh, you know, the algorithms are certainly going to get smarter, um, and that's going to be a big help in terms of tipping and queuing and letting human analysts focus on the really meaty problems. Uh, I'm still a pretty skeptical of machine learning um, 
in a broad sense, in the, I think it's very, very good at solving a very defined problem uh, where there's a lot of training data uh, ahead, you know, finding specific types of damage, for example. Not all damage, because damage manifests itself in so many different ways. Um, only, in, until you have a general artificial intelligence, which may come, but it's certainly not there yet, right, you know, no machine is ever going to take a textual eyewitness report and apply that to an image and say, okay, I can see what's being described here, right? You know, that requires actual human thought. Um, you know, similarly, uh, even when you're dealing with simple damage detection, it varies so much that until you've built up that data set, and that data set can vary significantly from one part of the world to the next, uh, you're still gonna have to deal with an awful lot of uh, manual identification and labeling just to define the problem for a computer. Once you've got that going, and it may take multiple tries, you can then extend that, and that can be helpful. Um, that's sort of where we are now. Um, but in terms of uh, humans not, not being in the loop or having merely a supervisory role, um, you know, I've seen many, many images where there have been sort of vague claims of human rights abuses, uh, you know, perpetrated, and you, you drill down, and you, you, the human brain has to actually put those pieces together. No machine can do that yet, and I don't see that happening for quite some time. Yeah, great, thanks. Great way to end. So now it's your chance. I want to recognize that there's also another <laughs> microphone, if anybody wants to rush over uh, to my right side. But please, and if you want to introduce yourself, please go ahead. Hi, this was really fascinating. I'm Mindy Reiser, uh, connected with many organizations, but uh, particularly with the Coalition on Science and Human Rights. We've been organizing the webinars uh, for human rights organizations on evaluation. I'm going to ask a question out of an abundance of ignorance, but, but why not? Uh, we talk a lot about the coming changes in technology, the ever-increasing capabilities. I don't quite understand where we are with being able to use our satellites to really plumb down to a very, very close observation. You mentioned your, your hope originally that we could see much more of what's been happening with the Uyghur detention centers and how difficult that was. So where are we going with enabling that? And that absolute ignorance here, I don't know how many astronomers turn up at these meetings, but we know we have an incredible array of telescopes across the world that are enormously powerful. How can that technology be mobilized? Obviously, they have extraordinary capabilities with optics over innumerable distances. How can this be channeled to, to the things we're talking about? Okay, great. I'm gonna take a few questions, and my panelists are rapidly thinking about their responses. I'm not sure how much of the astronomy they can manage, but we will let them try. Please, you're next. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Cheryl Lazatter Beach. I'm the immediate past president of the American Association of Geographers, and your words are music to my ears in terms of geospatial data and the use of geospatial data for the greater good. Um, I just wanted to say that the AAG has a project on geospatial data confidentiality working with uh, the Consortium for Political and Social Research at University of Michigan to lead an NSF-funded program on challenges facing geospatial data intensive research communities. And one of the problems is, on the one hand, you need publicly available data to do the essential work that you do, but there are uh, other casualties of exposing geospatial mm -hmm. data to the public or, or to um, you know, different, different government players. And so this consortium is working on ways of creating secure environments in which to work with and share those data, much as you might in, in the psychological or medical world have um, human subjects research protections for certain kinds of data that are in filing cabinets. This is a similar project aimed at uh, creating um, more privacy for geospatial data. So perhaps um, we should be expanding our projects such as these to be able to create a consortium based on the Science and Human Rights Consortium to share data for, for human rights. Um, one thing as well is um, you, mentioned, you mentioned the situation of the Uyghurs in China and I just want to thank uh, AAAS and uh, Amnesty International and many other communities for helping us with our campaign to um, secure the 
information about and the release of a geographer and university president who, who we just learned uh, from Amnesty International was, was jailed and is, is under a death sentence. Um, there's an editorial about him in the October 11th issue of Science, and we just really thank you for um, helping us to uh, publicize uh, Tash Polat Tayap's um, situation and hope that we can get at least one geospatial scientist out of jail and back doing science um, for the greater good of the public. So I'll, I'll leave the questions about geospatial data, um, privacy, and sharing as, as part of this. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Really useful. Yes. Yeah, thanks. I'm Salil Tripathi from the Institute for Human Rights and Business and speaking as a complete ignoramus on this issue. But when you, when Umesh, when you mentioned this fact that there is a picture taken and then it takes another two weeks before the satellite might come back at the same space and something has happened in between. So my naive question is that are there relayed satellites which constantly take these images and is it possible to establish a chain and link so that the story can be built probably in real time? Thank you. Thank you. We'll take one more, and then we'll hand it to the panel. But that, I'll give you one more round, so don't be disappointed if you haven't gotten up yet. Rachel. Um, I'm Rachel Carr. I'm an undergraduate student. And I'm just curious about the connections between um, the future you see for this high-level technology <laughs> and any connection you might see for the lower-level technologies of mapping being used by protesters in Hong Kong and those other kind of grassroots applications. Do you see um, those futures coming together? Thank you. So, great questions. Do you need me to summarize them, or you all remember them very well? Okay, who wants to start? Oh, Jonathan. <laughs> Go for it. Triple A-S. Okay. Um, uh, Rachel, yes. Um, I do. Um, yes, uh, temporal resolution <laughs> is increasing a lot um, through the launch of multiple satellites in multiple orbital inclinations um, and in these constellations. Uh, so that, that is in the process of changing. Uh, you know, it used to be two weeks, you know, now planet is uh, imaging the entire land surface of the world uh, at one meter resolution once every day, um, subject to cloud cover, right? Um, so that, that's changing. But there's the trade-off with spatial resolution. You, to, you get that rapid revisit, but you don't get the, the spatial resolution. Um, astronomy, uh, my undergraduate degree, actually. Um, Yes. Um, so the uh, Hubble Space Telescope was, in fact, um, essentially a uh, an NGA National Reconnaissance Office spy satellite uh, pointed the other direction. Uh, the uh, payload shroud uh, and the launch vehicle and the primary optical system are the exact same thing. Um, so there is this symbiotic relationship between that. The US government really, really, really was interested in funding big telescopes um, pointed downwards. Uh, and then uh, NASA said, hey, why don't we, can, can we get in on this, right? And then and, and, and flip it around. Um, in terms of drilling down uh, to the super high resolutions, there are some physical constraints that you're dealing with. Um, there's only so much that you can do before you reach what's called the sort of diffraction limit. Um, uh, and you have to get your, at which point you have to get your mirror even bigger, which makes it impractical to launch uh, within the uh, you know, uh, aerodynamic uh, cone of a rocket, right? Sometimes you can get around that with big unfolding mirrors and that sort of thing. but. Um, Really, if we could get you know sub uh, single centimeter resolution um, from space, then we wouldn't be investing all of the uh, imagery or all of the uh, effort that we are currently in drones. So you can you can tease out sort of what the practical limits of these imaging systems are by seeing what the uh, Defense Department is doing. Uh, all these DOD drones means that you're not getting that resolution from satellites, and you're not getting the persistence either um, from satellites. Uh, they certainly have better spatial resolution than what we have. Um, I've heard rumors of somewhere slightly south of 10 centimeters per pixel, um, but below that you can uh, you get drones. And, uh, ethics, yes, we have a, a whole um, report on the ethics of uh, sharing uh, geospatial uh, information in crisis situations that I'd love to talk to you about. Um, but I won't go into this. Is that on your website? Or yeah. 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 Sorry, I think... and, and I will no longer monopolize the mic. <laughs> no, 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 it's great. And I mean, the ethics side go both ways in terms of, obviously, if it's using an investigations against defendants, sort of chain of custody, there are a whole bunch of issues, I'm sure, on the justice side, both in terms of uh, the victims and defendants. 
Would you guys like to add Umesh so, Nicole? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm a big fan of AAG. I've attended multiple AAG meetings, and uh, it's really uh, uh, glad to see uh, AAG part participating and uh, partnering with the these organizations. And um, I, I think multiple organizations are uh, working, as far as I know, uh, and my knowledge is through the uh, uh, media circle, uh, towards the, um, the scientists who is um, uh, jailed in China. There has been issues in the past where I think uh, there was uh, one scientist in, uh, in Italy who was jailed because he was not able to predict the earthquake, which is mind boggling, but scientists were got together and uh, wrote a, uh, a letter, various organizations. There was another incident happened in South America just uh, last year where um, another scientist was facing this thing, glaciologist. So our uh, multiple organization, I am part of it, were involved in it. So um, uh, I will look into that uh, uh, work about privacy. I think it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, um, we are not allowed to look into our neighbor's backyard if there's a fence, and, but there's a satellite which we can take a look and see what's going on there. So I think there's a privacy is a challenge, but I, I'm actually, um, uh, I, I know there's a lot of different things going on with the social media and the privacy issues. But here we are at the point where we need uh, more readily available data sets and not data sets that are uh, under the closet. Uh, so um, I'm a big pro proponent of the availability of the free data sets. And I think uh, uh, how we haven't reached the point where all these uh, deluge of data sets that we are talking about is readily available to all of us. They are not. They are uh, costly. Uh, we can't get these uh, uh, planet data sets unless there's a, there's a charter. And, and I don't blame them because they have uh, invested significant amount of money, so they need to make the money out of it. But I think uh, uh, privacy is a big issue that uh, scientific community need to get together soon and talk about it. But data availability is also, I think, in my opinion at least, uh, uh, freely available data set is an important uh, aspect. And I'll take one more actually, and then uh, I'll let Nicole uh, highlight the other factors, which is the, um, uh, you're talking about the um, building a story. And I think this is, this is the thing that uh, scientists like me doing on a daily basis. We are taking data sets from various different satellites, and, and at this day and age, we have so much data sets available that we can definitely build a story. The, the challenge that we have is they are not talking in the same language. So we need to figure it out. Like an example I used was Landsat, which is all of us paid money to, to launch that satellite and data set is available for all of you to at least so far uh, freely download. That's a 30 meter resolution and in, in a different uh, wavelength in a lot of these bands. If you take a Sentinel, which is European satellite, has a different resolution. So you cannot just simply use it. And, and a, a, a challenge is that uh, algorithm needs to be uh, properly uh, managed, trained, but uh, analysts need to understand that as well. And capacity building needs to be done uh, where um, people can use these data sets in an effective way and try and compare apples to apples and not apple to orange. And, and there's an issue. So th even the NASA MODIS data set is available on a daily basis, but that's a kilometer resolution, unless there's a big wildfire going on, which really can't do too much, or a, or a tornado, or a big uh, 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 weather pattern is, is developing, or something of that nature, large scale. If you want to do something at a localized level, it becomes challenging, uh, where 30 meter resolution data set might not be useful or enough. So building stories are great and, and I love it and we are doing it and we are, have become so much better in that uh, in, in last decade or so. But I think um, it's quite a way to go still in, in that sense. Um, Nicole, you wanna try and take- So yeah, I just have some reactions because I still don't know 
almost what was said here. <laughs> so it's like perfect. But um, to the to the to the la like the mirrors and the diffraction and the rocket, and I was like, whoa, okay. So, um, but what what I would say uh, is, and maybe it's this type of forum and conference. Um, one of the things uh, to the to Rachel, I think Carr, um, yes, your question at the end of like what we're bringing together. One of the uh, what I some of the ideas that I hope. Um, and maybe in conferences like this, we've done this when we, we've brought two different people, to, two different groups of people together. So uh, at, in, in the Holocaust Museum, so that so one group can hear hear the troubles and the challenges and the gaps, and the and then the academic group can be like, okay, we're going to look at this. And that was on transitional justice, a, a very precise slice of issues. So. You know, there's, I, I don't know if any of you have heard of Ushahidi. It was a platform by which um, people were sending real-time information about um, uh, violations that were happening in Kenya um, on their phone to warn other people. Um, and I, I was thinking, um, in, in, in other cases, why can't the, to bring it back to the human element of human rights violations, why is there a way in which Ushahidi people have the individual ability to access, to talk about data from the fire hose, but access sending images up to the, sat, up to the satellite? Because uh, Ethiopia, Chad, Sudan, all these countries that have had Christ, major political uh, crises in the last year or and a half, all shut down the internet. And so there's this period of time where we just do not know what's happening. And the satellite imagery is, is not helpful in those cases, um, particularly with urban, urban uprisings. Um, and so the Ushahidi model, uh, and then the real, a real life uh, dilemma that we hit when the uh, the street protests turned into a revolution in Sudan from December to, to, to June uh, June of this year. Uh, the, the activists were. Uh, this was when I was in the U.S. government. They were begging us, help us buy satellite phone time. And we just couldn't, it, there wasn't, it was $10,000 for two minutes or five minutes. It was crazy. So, like, I, I just, the commercialization of giving access to people on the ground to some of this technology, I hope that we can move forward there. And I've seen that start to happen a little bit with open source street mapping, um, which I thought was phenomenal. We deployed it and funded a lot of it in Haiti after the earthquake for other communities that hadn't suffered an earthquake so they can get ready um, and everybody, you know, training young people to be able to like map their community, upload it to a site, um, and then take it to another level where there could be planning and other things, and all of the all of the different places that you that you all work in. I, I think there's just so many things there. You just have to have somebody sit, put two people from different worlds into a room and talk about the gaps and promise and challenges. Yeah, and then have the money, the resources, yes. and the political will <laughs> to fund it and move it forward. We have another question. Thank you. We, we ha oh my God, do we have mass movement? We do. <laughs> Great. Over to you, young lady. Please introduce All yourself. Right. Hi, my name is Syra. Um, I'm actually an imagery analyst at the Signal Program for Human Security and Technology at Harvard University. And everything you said really resonated, because uh, it's true, and I see it on a daily basis also. I'm glad that you all brought up this point of crowdsourcing because that's my question really. Um, obviously it's had huge implication, very positive also when it comes to uh, the mapping of disaster prone areas before and after, but I'm also thinking of the effects um, if you open this kind of, or have free data available to everyone in sensitive areas that are conflict prone uh, or have suffered, like mislabeling is an issue. As an imagery analyst, you're focused very much on the context and you use contextual information to, to label uh, and share information. So I'm just wondering, in terms of the future, like not only do we have this big data, you also have the push for open data, which yes, open data is great, but then there's also some limitations, and so I'm wondering where the privacy can then be uh, still considered while still having open available data. Great, thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Jessica Libertini. I'm an applied mathematician at Virginia Military Institute, but I came out of uh, Army Space and Missile Defense Command. Um, so that's the, the lens I'm thinking about is um, there's a lot of conversations about weaponization of space, um, whether the Outer Space Treaty Article 4 is something that is needs to be relooked at and whether the U.S. wants to do that or not. Um, there's a lot of conversations around that, but the, I love the way that Nicole brought up this idea of 
information and possibly using that to get um, to look at things like whether it's regime change or um, on the ground site of what's happening. And, I'm not articulating this well, but I'm thinking about as we enter the fourth industrial revolution, the idea that information is a weapon and can mm -hmm. be seen as a weapon. Mm -hmm. And so if we're talking about weaponization of space, and currently the Outer Space Treaty talks about a very undefined set of weapons of mass destruction, what's going on, and, and maybe this is really a question with respect to AAAS and thinking about um, the policy shaping piece of this, how do we make sure that information doesn't get categorized as a weapon in the context of being able to use information to discern what's happening on the ground when we're talking about space information? Thank you. And there's so many places to go with that question. Um, any others? Because I think I'm uh, probably looking for Teresa that I am getting close to my time and I know that there's uh, you wanted me to go straight to six before the next speaker? Okay, so we still have a little more time. Um, would anybody else like to ask a final question before we give it over to the panel to respond? Okay, so who would like to go first this time um, with a final wrap-up response to the two questions and anything else you would like to say that has not yet been said? Well. Uh I can, I can, I don't know if I have the answer to your question, to be honest, and I don't know if anybody has the answer to your question. Um, uh, scientists have always been blamed to uh, do the work within their own silos, and I think there is a, uh, a great realization that what we do matter outside our lab, so there's a push for the open data sets. And I, I'll be first one to admit that not the last one, but uh, to admit that uh, when the data becomes publicly available, you draw a bunch of different attention as well as uh, challenges how this data can be used as we all are seeing with the social media data sets that nobody knew can be used in such a way and be being used. Um, so I unfortunately don't have the answer a great answer. I do think that there is, and I, I know uh, Jonathan mentioned earlier about the document that exists on their website about the ethics policy, and we heard from the AG perspective as well. Um, I don't know where the line needs to be drawn. I, I, I don't really know, and I, I really think that a, uh, all these bigger organizations, along with the private partners who are putting these small cube sets, which are basically this big satellite, day in, day out, uh, how these data sets are going to be utilized in the future. Uh, am I complaining these data, availability of these data sets? Not at all. I really want these data sets. There, there will, needs to be a guidelines for these data sets to be used uh, in, in a proper way, sure. Does that, the guideline will be utilized by everyone? Never. We will, no matter how much guidelines anybody can put out, there will always be loophole or somebody who wants to utilize it in a different way will be able to find a way to utilize it. That's my opinion. So um, crowdsource has been uh, great for our work, and as you already know, so does the collateral data set, as I generally put it. So we have the satellite data. We don't know what's going on in real time, but somebody uploads a picture. We use those collateral data sets to figure it out or build a story around it. So I think uh, uh, my personal opinion, and I, I, I speak for at least a couple people who I work with on a, on a daily basis uh, and organizations, that um, uh, uh, I think the, there should be a policy out there, but uh, I really don't know if that policy is going to limit someone who really wants to use this data sets for whatever purpose. Uh, it's, it's really hard for me to tell that. Anybody else wants to add? Jonathan? Yeah, uh, I can add. Or you go ahead. 
No, I mean, I, I, I have big, you also, when you said the weaponization of space, I have big fears uh, that we see already, um, and it's on our list to look at a little bit deeper with the academic community on the weaponization of information. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you, sh you Shahidi and the crowdsourcing was, was very um, uh, instrumental in uh, helping people in Kenya. And then when, uh, when I worked in Burundi in 2016 and 2015, we knew the government would capture that information in real time. They had been, um, they had that type of technology shared probably from China. And so, you know, people were like, should we use that? Should we fund that? And we were like, I, we would not advise doing that. Yeah. that. That'll put people at risk. So uh, it's just like, yeah, I have, we have big fears about that. Yeah. And encrypt it and make yep. it safe. Jonathan. Uh, so with regard to crowdsourcing, um, you know, the cautionary tale that I always think of is the uh, um, uh, Reddit search for the Boston Marathon bomber that ended up identifying, you know, tons and tons of people as the possible bomber, including one poor uh, student who was su suddenly disappeared shortly before the bombing and then ended up to have committed suicide. And, um, you know, that was, and, and his name was spread throughout social media, which got picked up by the real media, and it was just a giant mess. Um, uh, that being said, uh, you know, I, I think that it shows great promise, uh, and, and my thoughts on the promise of it are somewhat similar to the, my thoughts on the AI thing, right, you know, where if you're dealing with a very defined task where you can train your users and your users are dedicated, certainly, you know, some of the uh, people who use those platforms are, are extremely dedicated and, and, and come up with great results. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think that, um, uh, so, so I think it's great, but I think that uh, if you're dealing with more generalized analysis, I think expertise is needed, um, and uh, so that, that's sort of my, my thought on that. Um, with regard to the data, though, uh, I, think, I think that ship has kind of sailed, especially when it comes to the privacy implications of it. I think that uh, since Google Earth and, and other platforms, but really mostly Google Earth, has become so ubiquitous, um, people have gotten pretty used to the fact that there is, you know, about 30 centimeters, sometimes more, uh, you know, when they've got their uh, aerial coverage in the developed world. Um, but, you know, th th that level of, um, of uh, imagery is generally okay. There are some exceptions like Germany's, uh, you know, right to be removed from Google Street View. Um, but I, I suspect that uh, there's not going to be much in the way of, um, uh, of, of further resistance to publicly available data sets at that resolution. Um, higher than that, yeah, you get into some pretty dicey territory, right? One of the things that we say when we do, we're doing these trainings with courts and commissions is that at satellite resolution, you know, you may be able to see a person as one pixel under ideal circumstances. Um, you know, Aerial imagery, on the other hand, is a whole different thing. There you can actually deal with identification of specific people, etc. cetera. Um, however, we do have invasion of privacy laws that cover this to some extent already, and a lot of those uh, came out of the early 20th century. There are actually editorials written by people right after air travel became a thing where you know, they're, Sir, should I be rusticating in my back garden and some ruffian in a balloon were to, you know, come over and, and look down upon me and, you know, in my state of natural whatever? Um, you know, and, and uh, so, you know, this is going to be sorted out in different countries in different ways. In the U.S., we have that concept of a sort of reasonable expectation of privacy. Now, what is reasonable depends on, you know, society's norms and mores um, and, and the availability of technology. So that may shift over time, but I think that that's the legal framework that is probably going to be used when you're dealing with, you know, the implications of, of satellite imagery. But I will say I am not a lawyer. Um, with that caveat, and I'm not a lawyer, I have very little that I think I can say about the weaponization of space, except that my sense is, as someone who's very interested in space, that I, I, I suspect that as um, uh, private sector space exploration continues apace and increases that we will find that the current legal regime governing uh, low Earth orbit and even cislunar space generally uh, will be found to be woefully inadequate. Uh, and I think that that's going to have to change um, in response to the fact that, you know, people are just going to be out there doing stuff. and. Uh, you know, but, but, but what that form will take, I, I, I have no idea. 
So a huge uh, area that we've ended up with and a tremendous need, I think, for great detailed policy discussions about information, um, big data being the new oil, about the role of uh, private sector actors, about the role of government, about how do we put some of these technologies to the use, the common good, the use that um, we'd like to see it put to as shared human rights uh, and science community and also fund that and get the political will. I assume all of this is being taken forward by our great friends at AAAS as they move forward with their technology um, and artificial intelligence um, and human rights work. Um, we want to send our thanks as University of Dayton to AAAS to, uh, for working with us as an academic institution and building our capacity to be able to um, get our students in a position where they can work in this area um, and be able to contribute to human rights uh, discourse, advocacy, investigations, um, hopefully prevention. And ultimately, I think it's clearly needed despite your, Jonathan, great view of privacy considerations from a legal perspective, that considerable amount of policy discourse and change is going to be um, required in this area. So thank you all for your focus and attention and for engaging with us in this conversation. And um, have a great evening, because it's coming up. So thank you, and thank you to the panel. <laughs>